Hello everyone, thanks for coming. My mum is now watching live from her bedroom. Paul Buckley offered me a job and was kind enough to keep the vacancy open for the six months it took to get my visa application Mike. approved. Microphone! Oh, uh, 17 years ago, Paul Buckley offered me a job and was kind enough to keep the vacancy open for the six months it took to get my visa application approved. I just wanted to say thank you for that. This is uh, how my portfolio looked back then. Um, kind of a lot more gritty than it is now. These, she is? She's not snoring. <laughs> uh, this is images by Ali Campbell. She's waving to you. This is probably as 90s as a 90s cover could be. Um, we shot this one with a security camera in our flat in Stoke Newington, and that's my friend Dom who now sells kind of like skincare products in Margate. He's doing really well for himself. <laughs> They're available in Selfridges and Ace Hotel. Uh, these are kind of just, I really like working on covers that mimic packaging or something, you know, another style of design. So these were, this was the original paperback cover, the large format, and then this was the trade edition, which ran in two colorways. Okay, so, where am I? So I, uh, how did I end up in book design? Well, I studied at a college that steered towards a career in branding. And at that time I started collecting books based on the cover art, but never really thought about it as a, a possible career. So I left college and I applied for a job in branding. And the interview was terrible. Um, they took my portfolio and they ran it by co-workers and they came back 20 minutes later and said they weren't interested and asked if I was from a bad year at college. <laughs> so I cried <laughs> and I went home, which I went and actually this is a friend's and I worked with them to help with the animals. So I wasn't very good at that either. Um, <laughs> I left the gate open and the horse galloped up the street and into the village. So frightening. Um, I almost burnt the farmhouse down by trying to roast chestnuts. And I left the door to the bakery unlocked. And that's where the baby chicks, we, you know, we kept the baby chicks there to keep them warm. And the dog got in and like killed a few of them. So my time was, uh, I didn't, <laughs> I had to start thinking about another career. So um, I started doing fake book covers and um, somehow got a job at Penguin UK. Um, I was there for, in England for uh, 12 years before kind of relocating to the US. This is a sheep. <laughs> if you don't know. I didn't have much, much luck with sheep either, but I won't go into that story because it's really kind of, no, I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> so this is, this is kind of my work in the US. This was under Paul. Um, I was struggling with it and Paul basically said, just put a bear shagging a doll on it. So that's what I did, it kind of somehow got approved. Most of the time I work with photography, I'm like a massive photography fan. Um, this came from the author and we ran it on Encoded just because the quality of the image wasn't that great. And um, we ran a, like a white foil on the type just to give it like a waxy quality, which I felt like this needed. Most of my covers are stock art, stock photography with centered type. If I can get the type all the same size, I'm like super happy about that. So that's kind of how that is. Uh, so this is one of the images I found just from, you know, spending a lot of my time in McNally Jackson and Dashwood books, looking at photography books. I mean, I used to collect a lot of them 
you know, I was buying photography books all the time, but with a kid at home, the space is a little tough, and you know, our guest room currently looks like it could be in an episode of Hoarders. <laughs> so um, I've stopped buying them, and I just kind of um, jot down the names, and I spend, you know, I just Google them when I get home. So this guy, this guy is uh, called Matthew Brandt, and he takes photographs and then develops them of the place he took them. So you know, he took this photo of a lake, and he developed it in the lake. And I kind of wanted him to do the whole series for this. Like this was for Albert, um, but it just didn't work out. So I just took that. Um, I ran with that theme of like distortion or distressing, and just worked with stock imagery. And this one was originally black and white, so I printed it out, crumbled it up and then colorized it. This is something that wasn't actually approved, but I just kind of, it's probably the one cover I keep going back to. And when I'm procrastinating, which I was about this project last week, I went back and I started working on it again for some reason, I don't know why, but this is, this is just one thing I just keep, I just keep going back to this thing. I'll crack it one day. Um, this is probably as conceptual as I get. Uh, the image was from Shutterstock. <laughs> uh, the good thing about working at the Penguin Press is that you know the authors are amazing. So getting to work with these you know these talented people is great. Mary is you know working on Mary's books. She has such a great following. It's a, like a real pleasure. Sometimes she has specific you know instructions on what she wants. For this one, you know she wanted a. A, a scene that she remembered from her childhood and she sent her, I got an email that told me exactly how the stream should look, what the flowers were and that kind of thing but we just couldn't get it there and she eventually just approved this one, which I kind of think worked. This one she wasn't really, that. we didn't get any instruction for this one, it was just a matter of just finding the right image. This I worked on with Tao uh, Pynchon sent this image in and we were just like how the hell are we going to get that to work? So Tal extended it vertically, added the tree, added the night sky, and then he just took my type and just made it amazing. I don't know how he did that. Um, and he did the whole package and he used a um, gradient on the flat to neon pink gradient that I stole and used on Gongo. Thank you. <laughs> uh, these are for Albert. They just kind of I don't normally work on novels, I find them really hard because I'm such a slow reader and... Oh! <laughs> this was one of the um, few where I read it and I just kind of, it needed to be a lollipop. I tend to show a lot of comps, you know, because I'm just so insecure about my work. I just flood whoever asks with like as many as I possibly can. Um, I would show them, but I, my hard drive died when I um, was putting this together, so I lost a lot of my work. Um, similar thing with this, it just kind of felt like it needed to be that way. This is a small book I did for Christopher. <laughs> and another one I did, a small title. Um, I love working on nonfiction, so any time I, I can do that, I, it's one of my, my, my favorite things to do. For Ing Su, this one, I wasn't really sure what the art meant, but it just felt good. <laughs> so I, I kind of just work it in and, and kind of hope for the best. If, I'm, if my work is not centered and using a stock image, so go. I'm working with panels that look like newspaper clippings. <laughs> So there, it's that. This one was kind of done the night before, kind of it needed to it needed to be done. It was like, we were just down to the wire. I had Rodrigo working on it. And I kind of really liked how these looked, but I just knew it was going to be tough getting a greasy pizza approved, <laughs> even if it had really nice stickers on it. <laughs> so he reworked it and said this, which I liked, but it just didn't happen. This is my Roberto de Vic moment. <laughs> These are my all type covers again, they're just centered but without the image basically. <laughs> this one was because there wasn't any subtitle, you know, the cover was so clean that I was actually really afraid to I started working with panels and borders and 
different typefaces and my publisher was just like they'll just strip it down to the bare essentials so we got it to this part and it got approved and then I was just really concerned about you know the printing because I was worried it might look too cheap so I ran a, a pastel uh, ink in the background which I pulled back so far on press that the press guys were just shaking their heads because you could <laughs> barely see it but it just added a tiny bit of warmth to the cover we replaced the um, the black with a toyo that had a slight blue to it and then we just debossed just to make sure we everyone knew we could we had money to spend on it we, <laughs> uh, so we decided not to so the thing i like about art direction is obviously that i get to work with people that are way more talented than me so um whether that's in-house this is christopher king's work recent work and this is sam russo's or whether it's kind of with freelance this is actually tells one of tells covers he did for me that i really like um, this was the first cover I actually gave out. I gave this to John Gray and just begged him not to make me look like an idiot. And um, that's pretty much how my art direction goes these days. <laughs> Hasn't changed. He did an awesome job. Uh, photo shoots, this was something we did for Omnivore's Dilemma, which I really liked, but it just didn't work when it was reduced down to cover size. So we ended up like stripping it down to something more minimal. This was a originally I'd given it to Evan. Evan is my go-to for the big booklet because he he just does it so amazingly well. Um, but these just didn't work out. Oh, the glory of it all was um, this was done by non-format. I kind of worked with um, Chell, who's half of non-format in at Random House in the UK. He was working on one of the imprints and sat next to me, so I kind of had it in. So I was hoping to use that at some point. This turned out to be the project where I got to do that. But the author had other ideas and he wanted to, he brought in a pre-headed Hydra figurine and said he wanted to use that on the cover in some way. So we hired Jason Holly and he did a couple of sketches. And then I found this when I was looking back through my files and this was John Gray. So I guess at some point I commissioned him, but I can't remember why. <laughs> I think maybe maybe Sean wanted me to. Um, then I tried this working on it myself, which I don't think I, I didn't even show that. And then we ended up going back to this, and this got approved, but sales killed it um, because they wanted some colour. So my publisher said, "Why don't we just do two colourways?" So we just flipped it, and um, sales were happy. <laughs> uh, this, uh, you know, this was something that. Another big offer that I stress so much about, um, but I stumbled across like this article in a magazine, and I just thought it was just right for this title. But you know that seems too easy, so I hired someone out just so I, because I, I just wanted to. And um, so these were the sketches that A2 SWHK supplied, and they're great. And then Kerr Noble sent these in, which I find, had, you know, I like the fact that they were slightly ugly, but um, we ended up going with this version. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to end by saying that I, um, I, never, I never got to, I wanted to put a bunch of slides in of everyone that's done work for me to just say thank you for making me look so good, um, but I just ran out of time. Um, so, thank you for everyone that's going to come out. And I want to hand off the towel. Thanks, Darren! <laughs> <laughs> I made it. Hi, guys! Oh my god, this is the love of my life, Maggie, by the way. <laughs> She's sitting right here, Maggie, Hello, like, say hi to everyone. <laughs> Shit, guys, I'm, like, a little drunk. <laughs> I know they say, like, beer before liquor, never sicker. I had, like, a beer and two wines. Where, where am I? Where's my presentation? Oh, okay. Got it. Thank you, Darren. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Serge. Thank you, TDC. It's always been, like... 
this will never happen. And I'm glad it happened, so thank you. All right, so first I was born. <laughs> so I know you're all happy about that. I was born in Israel in the mid 70s. It was fucking gorgeous over there. There were still no Russian immigrants. It was fucking amazing. It was all like sand dunes and beaches and it was amazing. It was still like liberal. So that was me. And I was, I think I was uncircumcised still, no dress. So I Googled like the town I was born in, but yeah, you can see how fucking gorgeous it was. It was like Miami. And that's the city hall. So like I asked my dad, I was like, dad, did this building exist? And he was like, yeah. And everyone who worked there complained that like there was no AC and there were no cubicles. It was all like open plan. Anyway, that's like the gorgeous place that I come from. So then the never ending story. So like one of the, my first like biggest influences in my life is like 80s fantasy sci-fi movies. So, um, can you hear me? Yeah. I wanna make sure you can hear me. So, <laughs> so anyway, this movie like changed my life forever. And then there was legend, it was all like, you guys, movies in the 80s were like, bonanza of amazing stuff, like legend. Look at these movie posters, Krull? Did anyone see Krull? Yeah. Amazing! <laughs> Clash of the fucking Titans? So everything was about like a guy with a sword and like a beautiful woman, like, oh, I'm helpless, like, help me. So I started drawing like stuff. And like I made movies like Dream Flame, a film by Tal Goretsky, that was my movie. And it was like a guy and a girl, but she has a sword, like they're gonna kick ass and they're like having sex on the side. And like I don't even know how old I was. I was like ten maybe. So this is all me. I was like obsessed with boobs. Like I drew naked women constantly. I worked so hard on this. I like X-Men, like so I would draw like heroes. Like scandalous, <laughs> and then I was like 14. I went to the prom. So like, <laughs> yeah, man. I'm still best friends with this girl, Catherine. She's amazing. Um, I went to the prom every year. <laughs> so then I saw this cover in the library, and I, I worked in the library, and I was like, actually, this is not even the real cover. It's like a weird paperback cover, but. I know, like, anyway, Chip Kid, like, I was like, what the fuck is this? Like, it was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen in my life, and it smelled really good, too. Like, I was really into smelling books. It smelled like perfume. I think it was, like, the women who were, like, getting this from the library were, like, leaving their scent all over it. So I was like, fuck, this is incredible. Okay, so at the same time that this was happening, there was also Broadway, and I, I love Broadway. So... This show, look at this fucking poster. Like, does this happen these days? Like, it was amazing. And I think the stage was like water or like a mirror or something. It was amazing. Okay, cats. Cats, I mean, it's still running. And this is, this is like one of the most amazing posters I've ever seen. Cat, this is um, James McMullen, I think, an illustrator who did all the Lincoln Center shows. He still does them. I was in love with this stuff. Okay, so then, so my parents are both engineers, and they were like, no, 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 no arts for you. You have to be an engineer. So I was like, okay. So I went to this school, which is in Long Island. It's like half an hour away, but it's in an old Pratt mansion. So it's like a billionaire's like, you know, like mansion basically that's like hundreds of years old, and it's tuition free. So I was like, okay, I'll go to this engineering school. And they just taught marine engineering there, like about ships. I was like, whatever, yeah, I can get into that. <laughs> I mean, look at this school. Like, it looks like Downton Abbey meets Hogwarts. We had, like, access to the water, so, like, we swam every day. So then, not only is the school so fucking cool like that, but then they used it in movies, like, over and over again. So this is a still shot from Batman Forever, starring Val Kilmer. And like they brought in these horses. It was like amazing. And I was there and I yelled something to Nicole Kidman too that she was unhappy about. I was like, <laughs> like it was like right after a take and they did like 2,000 2, takes for like the most boring scenes. And I was like, Nicole, we love you. And she turned around and said something. And then, then like 
then they like made us all leave and they were like she was really pissed that whoever yelled that out like anyway nicole kidman man okay so this is actually i googled the school this is a still from the show blind spot which is on the air now and they're still using the school so that's the school that's it so while i was at the school i wasn't too keen on engineering i didn't really like the smell of engine oil at the time and, I mean, now I'm a lot more butch, but at the time I was like, I didn't like getting my hands dirty. So like, what I did was I would go to the library. They had this amazing, we had to live in this place, by the way. Okay, so it was pretty cool. But I would go, they had an amazing library with like New York Times magazines, like from forever. So I would just, I felt like I had like the freedom to do whatever. So I would take all the New York Times magazines and just like, cut them up and make collages out of them. So I worked on this forever. It was for interview with the vampire. And I was like, oh cool, I got the characters. And like the humans turn to stone. And like everything is like amazing. So there's flowers in the sky. So that was like my big moment. Like, and then I, then I dropped out of the school. And okay, so then I actually had like a couple of months to spare. I was just a sophomore and I had to like use up my math and science credits still, but like, I went to work at FSG as an intern, and um, this is like forever ago, and Michael Ian Kay was there, and I just would like cut comps for him and like make idle chat. And this is one of the books that he, were, it's a terrible Google image, but it's a glorious illustration by Ruth Martin, who's a watercolor artist. This is one of the things he worked on when I was there, uh, which still like inspired me, I think. So then I went back to Stony Brook just to finish up with my credits. And while I was there, I did not do the type for this. I didn't know Quark, but I did like make theater posters with like cut paper and glue, which is why I love Photoshop so much. But I just like would steal people's photos and like make shit out of them and you know. So then I went and got my first job and I was like a computer programmer at um, an insurance company. And while I was there, I mostly worked on this erotic French novel. And I, I did it on post-it notes. So I, these are the two that I found. I'm, I've always been obsessed with boobs, like, forever. Okay, so then I was like, okay, maybe, uh, I mean, things, like, happened. Like, after this, I thought I wanted to be an actor, so I tried being an actor for a year. And I just didn't make any money. I did a couple of shows, but no money. So then my boyfriend at the time was like, ah, you go to The Gap too much and Banana Republic and like, it's time for you to get a job. So like, I was like, okay, I'll learn Photoshop. So like, I learned Photoshop and then I started taking some classes at SVA. And this was from like my first class. It's for the Who's Tommy, it's like a CD package. And then, oh, this was for like a later class, like some guys from Spotco taught it. And like, I made like a poster with my, starring myself, of course, as Macbeth. <laughs> After this, okay, so then Mickey Ward. So this is probably completely illegal. Like, I think I must have signed a non-disclosure agreement. But at the time, I was pretty okay in Photoshop, so I was working as a retoucher. And, like, one of my friends from this movie poster company that I worked at, Grayson, um, asked me to do this. And uh, it was for the movie The Wrestler. So uh, basically, I had to go to New Jersey. And Mickey Ward kept can like he was supposed to show up at this photo shoot he kept canceling so Grayson was like I can't do this job I'm gonna give it to Tal so then I showed up and then he canceled and then eventually Mickey Rourke showed up and he was supposed to pose for these uh, for the opening credits of the movie so this is him with some like <coughs> fake blood oh shit we just saw that this is him with Darren Aronofsky the director like the director was like directing him during the photo shoot and then um, the point was we were gonna take these magazines that existed from like the 80s and like just put Mickey Rourke's face on them. So like we did this like 80 times and eventually like like the movie credits looked like this. I didn't design them but she was awesome, the girl who designed them and it was fun to work on. So this is the kind of work I did before book covers and then I was like, I don't wanna retouch, I wanna design. So <laughs> That's when I met these two, like at the same time. So I took a book cover design class at Parsons, starring Evan Gaffney, and Allison Forner was a student in the class. That's where I met her, so I met both of them at the same time. And this is some work that I did for Evan in the class. Like, I, every, I didn't know what Getty was, so I just would like, go to T TJ Maxx and take a picture of a hat, or like. <laughs> then there was this. I don't even know where I got the telescope. I probably bought it. Okay, then, 
So then Evan was like, okay, let me like try and give Tal, like, like let's see if he can help me out in my business. Evan like had a lot of work. So I worked from home and like just did a couple of comps for Evan. This was the first, very first real book I worked on, <coughs> Asshole. And this was one of our, like, I think Evan actually like did some nice stuff to this after I sent it to him, but these were some of the, like I went to the Upper East, no, Upper, no, I went to like Museum Mile and took pictures of plaques. I bought a, like a money clip. I took a picture of my butt. I went to the museum and I actually like took a picture of like Greco-Roman butt. Okay, this is Allison actually like holding a mask for the Shiksa syndrome. I don't think like these were approved, but they were really fun to work on. <coughs> then I went to Penguin. So then like, I guess like Darren, I think was looking for, I don't know the full story, but I think like Darren and Paul, Darren, they were looking for someone. And I guess like they asked Evan and Evan was like, Tal's pretty good. So he recommended me and I think that's how I got the job. It was like years ago, but I think that's the story. So then Paul was like, Tal. Like, can you do this series of, like, this is the first in, like, an archaeological thriller series, like, can you do it? I was like, yeah. So I did this, like, in the week before. I think Paul does this as, like, his trick to sometimes give people freelance, like, after he hires them, and then maybe he can, like, get out of it if they do a shitty job. But, like, I did this. It was fun. Like, I bought sand and, like, put the sand in, everything. So then, like, I think my first week they gave me Shadow of the Wind, which was like a big book that was being repackaged and like it was totally fun to work on. I mean one of the greatest thing in my things in my life is I have like amazing people art directing me, like, you know, Evan and then Darren and Paul and Chris. And it's just like they just make me do good work. So, you know, like I ended up coming up with this. I needed a running man and you know, there's you whenever you look for a running man, there's never a good running man. Like so luckily this guy <laughs> This guy was available, and luckily we had a roof on top of the penguin building with a track. So, thank you, model. And that's Darren's old coat, by the way, that like, Darren, like, when he walks to the office, he like, takes off his coat and like, slams it on the ground, like, bam, it was like in a puddle on the ground, luckily we had a coat. So then there was this. It's like my love of putting little people in like massive environments with like pretty type. And I, I really kind of started falling in love with uh, old type. And like if I would find like a sample, I would like vectorize it and make new letters if I was missing them. So this was like a fun job as well. And then there was this that Darren showed already. So this was awesome. Darren was like, make my type look like neon type. And that was like fun to do. And then they freaking use it on the movie poster right there. <laughs> Like, this is like eight years later. So then, okay, I love like old time. And do you guys remember Bibliodicy? Like, they don't really like update anymore, but that's where I would get all my old type sample. More money. Like, I love working on money books. So then this book came along. So I read this book when it was in a rough draft. It's all about like this guy, Joshua Fower, who is the other Fower's brother. And he like decided one day, he didn't know anything about the memory championship, but he decided to like, I'm gonna learn how those guys who compete in the memory championships do their thing. So he like studied from all the pros. And one of the things they do in the memory championship is they like, you take a deck of cards, you shuffle it, and then you like show the contestant like the cards, like one after the other. And you're supposed to memorize it super fast and then repeat it without any mistakes. So that's where this idea came from. But then this book died for like a year. Like, I don't know if it, it hadn't been written yet maybe, or like needed to get edited. So then when it came back like a year or two later, I, was, I worked on it again and like I went through so many comps, I'm amazed that like I stayed on this project. But in the end it was like, the publisher was like, I think we need something with compartments. Because like what happens in your memory technique, this is really interesting, just trivia. So like you're supposed to take a boring old card like a two of clubs and assign like some really bizarre person or shape or a creature to it. So like you can make it a sumo wrestler or a tyrannosaurus and like then you can create a story for like the tyrannosaurus attacked the sumo wrestler then it ate like this S&M nurse and like like I don't know like you know so that's the story you go from room to room in your memory palace that you construct you go from room to room and you like that's how you remember your cards so that's how this weird cover came together um, then I started like 
I, I really like drawing, as you could see. Like, so like, I was like, let me draw a couple of things. So this came from like a drawing that was fun. That I'm, so, I'm amazed that Darren showed this cover because I found this in like, you know, like some deep dark alleyway of like one of my like um, like hard drives. And I thought I was like, that looked pretty cool. And I remember, I think what happened was that like Paul went home, and I knew that Paul had a thing for classic end papers. Remember end papers that looked like this. And Paul loves this junk, and he has so much junk in his office. I'm not 100% sure this happened. I know this happened on other occasions, but I like went into his office, I was like, ooh, look at this old book from the 1800s where the pages are like falling apart as I turn them. So I think I, I don't know if I scanned this, whatever. It was fun. It was, it, all it is is like a Photoshop filter on like a cool image, but it was fun. And this is the final cover, which was like, yay, my first handwriting, wee. <laughs> This was a, like, so John Gall had this weird, like, project where he was assigning book covers to be designed, like, in a night for books that, like, didn't really exist. And so this was something I did for him using a kaleidoscope where, like, I put the, like, the type in a kaleidoscope. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to maybe doing that again one day, like a kaleidoscope. So my love for old type repeats itself here. I think that maybe Maggie helped me with this because she always had some amazing sources as well for, like, old type, so... I got that. This was like eventually stolen by Kayak. Like, <laughs> but I was the first one who came up with it. I'll have you know. So this, this was like a, a book I worked on. It, it was a kill comp, but it was fun because it was like I used black paint and then like some crazy Photoshop filters. I think it was like plastic wrap and whatever. Um, this was a book that I worked on and then it died again, so like I wasn't even at Penguin when it finally got sh the cover changed and went to print, but it was fun to work on again because I had to construct this whole weird scenario. Um, and this was like embroidery, everyone does embroidery these days, but at the time it was like <laughs> embroidery. This was like another one, um, me and Darren actually worked on this together I think, like kind of painting this weird thing together. I won't get into the full story. But this is kind of like similar. I mean, I like worked on this with Darren. It was amazing. I, there's a kind of a shady story about it, so I'm not going to tell it. But <laughs> but it was a fun project. Um, and then we did these ebooks for Thomas Pynchon. I don't think either of these got approved, but um, they were also fun to work. Uh, Thomas Pynchon's books, Jesus fucking Christ, like make no sense, but <laughs> they were fun to work on. Um, and this also not approved, but fun. I think I used, like, this is before I knew about some filters that I know about now, so I think I actually bought, like, a projector and some sand and tried to actually do it. And this was, like, a drawing. Didn't get approved, but I still kind of draw like that. Oh, my God. So then this mind-blowing project came along, and thank you, Paul, for giving it to me. And, you know, I kind of fucked it up really badly at the beginning. And Paul went to China for, like, a month. So I was like, yeah, whatever, I'm totally fine with this. And then he comes back, he's like, Tao, where are those cogs? Like, there's a big book. So I'm like, oh, here, 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 here. And I was like off the mark, like in every way you can possibly imagine. And, and Paul was like, I'm really fucking worried about this Tao. Like, this looks horrible. And I was like, oh, geez, okay, okay, okay. So I think I took another week, showed him stuff. He was like, Tao, I don't know, Tao, like, you get out of my office. And then fucking like, I hear everything happening. Like, so I'm sitting in a cubicle like diagonally from his office and I hear him go like, Andrew, give me Shasti's number. And I'm like, what the fuck, Shasti? Like what's going on? And then like, then I hear Andrew making a phone call and Andrew sits like right there. And he's like, Shasti. And he's like, hey Paul, I got Shasti on the line. And Paul's like, all right, patch her through. And so, <laughs> So he passes us through, and I hear the whole thing. It's like five o'clock, but I'm like, what the fuck is happening? He's like, Shasti, I got this book. So he's like, oh, oh, you're going on vacation? Oh, okay. Click. I'm like, thank God, thank God. And then he's like, tap. <laughs> so I go into his office, and I'm like, <laughs> Thank God she's on vacation. And he's like, okay, so I think you need to put a moon here, a sun here, and like, da 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 da. So I go home, like, thank God, thank God I got my other chance. And so I went home, I smoked like the most gigantic bowl I've ever smoked <laughs> in my entire life. 
And eventually I came up with something like this, and thank God it was approved. And then I got this awesome series to work on, like Shadow of Night. These, these two are my favorites. They go on forever. So like, okay, so then Yelena's hired me to work on something. And um, I was so happy, thank you, thank you, Helen. And this was like, okay, let me try. Actually, this I didn't know what the fuck to do with either, and I went out. At the time, I was drinking a lot with Ben Wiseman. Like, we'd go out every night, like, get completely trashed. And like, I was like, Ben, I don't know what the fuck to do with this Yelena's project. And he was like, I don't know, girl, I don't know. So. <laughs> For whatever reason, like, I was like, let me stencil this shit out and pour some fucking sparkles in it. And it worked. And this became like my, I, I've made so much money off of sparkles and stencils over the years, like, but anyway, yeah, like that, like, so that, that was for Chris Brand when he first, like, joined Crown. Thank you, Chris, for giving this to me. It was fucking awesome. And it was a really good book, too. And like, uh, I think I used sparkles on it, actually. I was like. <laughs> that will all, it doesn't work as, as well as you think it would. And this was my first thing for Albert, I think. Albert like gave me a lot of stuff at the time and it was really fun to work on. It was a little bit of a nightmare project, but it was really fun to work on. And this one was for Albert too. This was like a like sexy like homo story. It was like, what is happening? And this was a oh wait. <laughs> So this is for Ellen again, like, continuing the saga of tiny people, like, this time I was like, ooh, let's cut a book up, and... Alright, so then this happened. So, eventually I got this job offer from Scribner, I'll get into it in a moment, and it was like, you couldn't refuse, it was an art director job, I was like, the fuck, like, I, I can't say no. So then this happened, like, I think this was my farewell party, but just look at that chest hair, it's perfect! <laughs> And then, oh, by the way, these are my two bosses in different time periods. So, like, that's Darren, that's Chris. W-X-O-U. They got kicked out of that bar, like, years later because of Paul, I think. But I'm like, Maggie. Maggie. Maggie uh. <laughs> these are some bad girls that I met outside. They were fucking vicious. So, at Penguin, we used to have Halloween. Um, so the, that year I went to Swan Lake, and then like we got this amazing picture of everyone who worked at Penguin at the time, so you can see like everyone in it. And so then I went to Scribs. Okay, so Scribs was fun. I mean, I have to say like in retrospect, it was a good it was a good job. It wasn't like the kind of people I'm used to working with at like Penguin or Random House. They're like different, but. <laughs> I also was like completely like unfamiliar with what being an art director was all about. I had no idea about anything. So I'll just show you like a cool, this was one of the cool projects we worked on. It was like a weird book by David Cronenberg, who was like a famous movie director. And it was about like kind of, it was a little bit horror, like there was cannibalism, there was technology, there was film. So this was my comp, which was rejected. And then this is Luke Lucas. He's this amazing typographer. So he did this like the letters licking themselves, pretty amazing. This was um, Brian Levy, who's Ben's boyfriend. <laughs> um, he does, he, he went to architecture school, so he's pretty like amazing at 3D software. So he made this, you know, he's got the technology and like there were bugs in the book and, and this is Alex Merto. I think this a form of this eventually went to paperback, but I think like, I don't know what happened with this book. I think the author designed the cover or something in the end, I don't remember. But all of these I like. So then I, I, I had a chance to work on some things and I was like, all right, you know, I love fantasy and stupid shit. So like, this was one of my things that was rejected, but I really liked it. And this is Lynn Buckley, who's not even here. I should have deleted this from the freaking presentation, but I like it, it's cool. And this was Mark Melnick, amazing. I don't think this book ever came out, but I love this cover because I'm Jewish. <laughs> This is Greg Kulik, like, pretty fucking cool, Greg. I don't think this is the final cover, but this was my favorite. And this is Ben Wiseman. And this is like, me and Janet, but Janet really kind of did it. Thank you, Janet. And this is Christopher Lynn. And this is Evan Gaffney. 
And this is Darren Hager. <laughs> and this is Jason Hewer. Where the fuck are you, Jason? <laughs> <laughs> and this is Jennifer Hewer, another H. And this is Rodrigo Corral, who's in Miami. <laughs> And so this was me, whatever, like, I like type, yeah, whatever. <laughs> so then this came along, it was a good project. It was like, I hired Sean Freeman, it was the most expensive cover I've ever worked on. He's like an amazing illustrator, he did the smoke and like, we, like I kind of worked on my lady. But it was a fun cover, because this book is kind of cool, it's like a sequel to The Shining, and it's about these fucking crazy people who like, feed on children who have The Shining, because it happens today, so they like, are looking for kids all over the country who have the shining and then they like inhale their power like and it's like smoke so that's the whole reasoning behind this so then i did this i think for jason um it was like some weird really weird book about like the church and american indians and werewolves and this was i killed one for malika but it was really fun to like recreate that whole muppet like typography another one for malika this was for Rodrigo. And also Henry, actually. I think Henry saved this, this comp for paperback. Another one is a sci-fi novel by Sidney Poitier. I don't think it ever went to paperback either. But it was cool. I think I was going for, I was in the Upper East Side, like at a doctor's office, because my cats were sick or something. And I was like, this book is so Upper East Side. Like, it was just so Upper East Side. But anyway. This, I don't know why there's so many comps of this. I just couldn't get rid of them. But it was like a really fun vampire novel I worked on for Joe Perez. It's like vampires, 1800s. Like, I love the blood drip. I just love blood drips. <laughs> and then this was the last cop. I don't know why I had so many to show. But anyway, that's that. So then I went to Crown. So this is a book I worked on. Um, it was kind of like a dystopian, like what happens in five years in Europe because of global warming, there's gonna be like this ice age. So, and this like really weird family like is, gonna, is like trying to like escape to Scotland and like they're living in a trailer and like, so this was like one of the ideas. And then this was another Aurora Borealis idea. And then like, I, I think I might have like, I, I wanted to do this thing with ice, so I think eventually I got in touch with Alex Merto because he had done something with a block of ice. I was like, where'd you get your ice? And I ended up going, but it was like in Queens at a bar, like a whiskey bar. I was like, fuck that. So I ended up finding that there was like an ice place like 20 blocks from work. And I went there on my city bike and loaded this like super heavy block of ice on the city bike basket and like rode back to work, like almost died twice doing this. And like, why? I don't know why. Like, this didn't go anywhere. <laughs> Eventually, Mr. Retro saved my life. And like, that's Mr. Retro right there. That's the final cover. So that was fun to work on. This was a sci-fi project I really enjoyed. Like, I like printed the cover on two pieces of paper and like folded them and took a picture and like ended up like with the cover kind of like that. This was a, a killed comp, but it was a uh, it was fun to work on. It's about like it's like a flowers in the attic type novel about these girls in this weird southern family that's very wealthy, but like the mothers, the grandmothers, the daughters, they all look exactly the same. Why? <laughs> so it was fun to work on this one. This is, Chris helped me with, but it was like the paperback for Spinster. Uh, this was a fun one. It was like, uh, it was really a memoir about this woman who grew up in Egypt during all the revolutions that were taking place. And like, I started out being really complex and using really complex um, ornaments, like kind of like Egyptian or, you know, well, I don't know if they were Egyptian. They were like Middle Eastern ornaments. And I just like eventually simplified it to this. And it was kind of like fun, like to just simplify it. And this is kind of like, this is this was a fun one. It's kind of an homage to a bunch of different people. I think Oliver would probably kill me for it, but like it's an homage to some screen printed posters I've seen. It's an homage to like Paul Rand, like leave canceled with the bullet holes. It's an homage, but it was fun to work on. So this this was also killed, but I was like trying some new things. I didn't use sparkles on this, but like I was trying to like make the type like disappear because it's here and gone. It's a, it's a really fun novel about like um, this woman who like, she's escaping from her horrible marriage. She's got a terrible history of bring, being like a drug addict. She's got two kids in the car. She gets stopped by a really crooked cop who like 
takes her outside the car, and meanwhile has an accomplice like kidnap her kids, and then when she gets back to the car, she's like, where are my kids? And he's like, what kids? You never had any kids in there. It was a, it's a really cool book, it's coming out in the fall or whatever, it's fun. So anyway, one of the cops. Um, this, so as a, the art director of the business imprint, this was my first project there, and I'm glad that I got to like illustrate it. And this was another one that I worked on with Ben Wiseman, uh, who did like this awesome illustration. Um, and then like, I guess like, I keep trying to like illustrate a couple of things, you know? So like, this was like, for this new book that's kind of, um, it takes place like five years away and like there's a lot of anti-Semitism in this country and like these rich Jews are assembling for a Seder in LA and they hate their father and this is him like mowing the lawn into the like title of the book. And they, they also love pancakes but it's Passover so that, that's yes. that. <laughs> And then this was the final cover. I was like, what the fuck? Like, they went with this? Like, none of us believed it, I have to say. But, um, and then I'm working on this. Chris, I'm sorry I'm showing it. I don't even know where this project is heading. But I'm working on this time travel novel. So, like, that's, that's fun to work on. So this is something I just completed with an illustrator, Justin Erickson, who, uh, Phantom City Creative, they do, like, a lot of really cool uh, illustrations. It's for the sequel to The War of the Worlds, and it's actually pretty good, the book, so. Um, so then, going back to some freelance that I've done for uh, other people, um, I worked on this hardcover. It's about um, F. Scott Fitzgerald when he worked in Hollywood as, as a screenwriter. So that was, that was cool, but then it got killed, but then it came back for paperback, like the type, so I was happy it came back. It's always fun. And this was um, something for Jackie at SNS. Uh, that was like a funny novel that took place like in the Middle Ages. Uh, I did this for Paul. It was actually like a really great collection of weird stories and like just did my best with it. <laughs> Didn't go anywhere, but it was a fun, it was a fun thing to work on. Um, and then this was for Darren, um, where like, yeah, it's, it's always fun to like shoot your own stuff, even though it's a real headache, but like if you can like get a book and shoot it and tear the, you know, silhouette out of it, it's fun to do. I did this for Darren too. Um, it was, it was a cool book. I, I also recommend this book if, when it comes out, but, uh, it was about this photographer who takes really weird pictures and how she fucks up this very conservative family. And, um... So this was fun to work on. I actually tried recycling this for Chris recently. <laughs> I always try to recycle. I worked on these. I don't know where this project is heading, but there was like this talk of a repackaging, so I worked on these. And then the last thing I did is this for Allison. So I got to like draw my lady with her boob. And that's where all the type for this presentation came from. The end. <laughs> that you have always had that sort of approach to how to do a layout? Is it just something that sits behind your awareness? And my question is for all of you, how much do you guys feel like you've developed your style? And how much do you feel like your style has developed you? Like you just insert something. 
How's that for an easy one? <laughs> I don't know. I guess like I always like sometimes I think when I worked for Darren and like when I had Tourette's and Penguin, like people <laughs> could hear me maybe singing like a soundtrack or like you know, like it's something that's like maybe that's where the epic quality comes from. Like when I work on a book, like maybe that's where it comes from. Like I kind of always see it as like the never ending story maybe. And, like, Do you shoot for it or is it just a part of your natural taste that kind of guides you without having to think about it? I think it's like I like theatrical things and like big things and maybe that's where I, I don't think I shoot for it, but I think it naturally just goes there. I, I think it's, it's part of your personality. personality. <laughs> <laughs> it's your personality. So for me, there's a big shift in your work. You start out, you know, doing this sort of rough type of exploration from the 90s and you quickly go into the sort of curatorial role of finding the perfect photo and crafting it in a way. And you do that, you know, you presented your work very simply, but it's also highly crafted. You do that production-wise, you're doing that with choice of imagery, it's all very considered. So what was the, sh you didn't talk much about the shift from the rough stuff to the clean stuff. Was that like one book to another, or did you explore, or? I think that's probably from going from a designer where you're concerned just about your personal portfolio. To being an art director and being concerned more about the entire imprint. And when you're working directly with a publisher and they want a book to do well, you tend to end up going for something that looks a bit bigger than it possibly should. Mm -hmm. um, and plus, I'm only working with a kind of stock image and I don't have the skills that Tal has for sure. So I, I don't have many as many elements. But, so, it, you know, I play with them a lot more to try to get them to work as well as I can. Robin, I feel like you have, you showed, like you mentioned that first book where it's um, the Pearls, the, the new title is Murder. I feel like, so you mentioned that that's not necessarily a style that you would work in, but you did so many comps for that that are super adaptive. It felt like you could speak any language in a way. So do you feel like you have a personal style that you're able to bring in, or is part of it just that you have to be able to speak every language? How does it work? I wish I spoke a lot of languages, but I agree with what Dan said. I think when you're working on an imprint where you have so many different types of books, types of editors, types of authors, you have to be able to be adaptable and not only think of yourself and your portfolio, but think about all the varieties that you're going to have to come up with. Yes. So how, how quickly would you know if it's something you're going to tackle yourself or if it's beyond your own capability and you'd say, I want to bring in so-and-so or this is perfect for someone else on my staff? Everything is perfect for someone else. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's, well, with our art department, where are they? Oh, I see them. <laughs> I think they're such like a, um, a good group that we bounce everything off each other. Like, this one is like, oh, my God, I can't take it anymore. This one takes it. So, um, and I think it's something that's our strength. So, we all, we all, there's a lot of covers, there's a lot of titles that, you know, three, four people have touched upon before it gets to the final. And it's not because, you know, this one wants it or this one doesn't want it, it's because we're there. We're helping each other get through it. So, I already forgot. Question? When, when would you? So you can crack at um, yourself, or versus when would you say, no, 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 this is for so and so? I think in the beginning of the list, you know, we, we, we launch, we find out about the books, we hear about them. And I think in the very beginning, you might hear something and, and, and want that. Some of the other people are more demanding, are like, I'm getting that. And that's, you know, that's how you start out from that place. And then very quickly, you find out, what have I done? <laughs> Get this <laughs> away from me. And then you like go and talk to someone, you're like, I really think it's solved. Than I will, <laughs> and try and like you know, or so it's it's an evolution. It's the best way, at least for us. And it did seem like that was in everybody's art direction. Where you might take a crack at it, and you're not getting it, so you give it to someone else, and then you bring it back in house. So, so that, it was interesting to see that across all three of you through different styles, different houses, that you had that kind of flexibility. I wonder if that's just the way art direction works, or or just you three. Well, as an art director, you can do that. So, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you want to go out that night and like, <laughs> <laughs> call Oliver, send it to Oliver. He's never <laughs> <a model. laughs> Anybody else? Any questions? Yes. 
how do you stay sane in the face of constant rejection? Each of you could answer that. <laughs> what are your coping mechanisms or what? They're what not you sane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. How do you stay nice then? <laughs> Personally, I just, in a meeting when everything's killed and it goes on to another designer and then another designer and then another designer, I just tend to smile until, I think time will run out at some point. <laughs> 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 and they have to pick something. Uh, okay. You know, they might go back to something from the very first round, but I mean, the only thing you can do is, I just tend to get other people working on it. If it's not going that well. Coping mechanisms? Just drinking? like work on something else. Like that's the good thing about like other projects is like you can forget about the crappy experience you had when you're having with something and like go work on something else. I think that that's that's kind of a coping mechanism. There's Spotify is a good coping mechanism. <laughs> <laughs> Robin, coping mechanism for rejections. Think, I think a lot of the same thing as the previous question. I think having a team, having People, look at look at our community. You know, I can call up Mandy, who's crushing it over at Hachette, and be like, "You're not going to believe what so what someone just said," and she'll be like, "Oh, I'll talk that." You know, so we can have each other, and you can, I can go home. I'm lucky enough to date a fellow book cover designer, so I can go home and take off my coat and poor him has to listen to it. <laughs> um, or even just you know, in the arts department, we come out of the cover meeting. Sometimes we all just, we have a candy drawer. We have flat files in the top drawer. It's just candy. And sometimes it's just That's like, you know, you just have to <laughs> have each other. And I think that just, it's, it's the support. It's the support at home. It's the support in the art department. And you can come out and have another human that may not be in your spot, but is like, oh, I got that. I understand. And just, I think it's other people. It's the, it's the whole thing. Thank you very much, you guys.